Hey, my name is uh, Paul Ingbretson. Um, I'm a painter in the Boston area, teach in the Boston area, have for about 35 years. Uh, someone suggested that I go ahead and begin to use uh, the internet a little bit more to talk about some of the points uh, that we make, say, in the course of a critique uh, for students. And um, I'm not sure where it'll go, but uh, I'm going to give it a shot, and uh, hopefully I can be of some help some use to somebody out there, or even just a conversation starter um, any which way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, there aren't a lot of painters who actually verbalize what they do, and um, I find myself being one of those guys. So uh, whether, you, whether I do it adequately is maybe another question, uh, but um, nevertheless, each of these points, um, which I've gotten, by the way, so far in question formats, which I, I would take from anyone, but somebody recently, Amy, sent me some questions, and I'm going to make an attempt to answer them with the idea of um, just seeing how this kind of a thing can work out. Um, I've already made some videos that I hope you've had a chance to review, but if you haven't, do so. Uh, they're related to the Boston School, uh, and uh, so you would punch in Boston School, Velasquez, Vermeer, Chardin, uh, Monet and pretty soon Sargent, and you'll be able to see the entire collection uh, that I put together. But that's a long, you know, those are almost an hour long each. But let me just give this a shot. I'm just going to begin to answer some questions. Um, and I, as, as, as my, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, cinema guy, the, the guy that shoots the shot here says, uh, model through, I'll do that. Um, but so let's just start with a simple one. Uh, do you paint wet into wet? Um, I was raised actually in a, a studio, of, an impressionist studio, where that wasn't much of a discussion. You spotted a bunch of colors around here and there, scattered them and scattered them, and sometimes you're wet into wet, and sometimes you weren't. Certainly at the beginning of a painting, you weren't painting wet into wet. Um, but um, the way I work now, and the way the Boston School worked, is very much a wet into wet thing. You'll certainly have to spot some colors onto the canvas and search for the color relations. But, um, but, uh, it won't be long before you'll be doing any drawing that happens uh, by melding two colors together by or joining them. Uh, we used to we have a we have a fundamental thing that we say, which is uh, draw with the darks, and you're not painting if you're not painting wet into wet. So if you combine draw with the darks and wet into wet, you would have put down a light. You would probably have made it a little bit extra large, and you would have drawn. Uh, and you would have drawn with your darks into that light, uh, which is a wet into wet uh, uh, effort. Another aspect of wet into wet, though, is if you have a major mass that's out of color in some way, uh, while it's wet, you can you can make adjustments to that color, and you'd want to do it if you're impressionistic at all. You'd want to paint it uh, by adding wet notes, the kind of notes that might adjust that note, not rechange the whole note, but just add wet notes into that and learn to meld them again into that surface. So you can adjust, say, a golden uh, tone across, a, across a, uh, a, 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 an aspect of an object. You can make it move to become a little more green as it goes to the left or a little more red as it goes down. And those kinds of adjustments are routine to painting, all wet into wet adjustments. I think the thing you'd want to think about when you're really wondering about what into what and what it is is to think about what it isn't because glaze painting for example the way Maxfield Parrish painted wasn't wet into wet in fact one of the reasons that pictures crack so badly is it requires a significant amount of drying time between layers and if you don't have enough drying time cracking is almost inevitable uh, even some of the 19th century painters Jerome Certain parts of uh, Sargent's work even have those cracking problems in those thinner areas where they painted wet over dry, but the dry wasn't dry enough. So, but that gets you at least a start. But wet into wet is, is the way we, is, the, is what we believe we're doing at all times once we get the canvas moving. So that's the wet into the wet question. Question two from Amy uh, was, um, how do you compare notes? Now, you know, I was reading actually just last night an interesting quote from uh, R.H. Ives Gamble, and Gamble was, was, was my teacher back in the 70s, and uh, 
a uh, very erudite guy with, with a tremendous background, thanks to primarily to Paxton, um, who was a student of, um, of um, Jerome's 19th century. But um, uh, <laughs> I think I forgot the question. Uh, oh, comparing notes. But his point was, his point was that what seeing is, is, is seeing relationally. So when you, he said, what you have to do, a student has to get it ingrained in his mind that whatever he's doing, no matter what he's looking at, he's doing a relationship to something. And that is where, that's what the seeing is. There's no such thing as the note. There's the relational set. There's this note doing something to that note. And over a total panel, there's all these sets of notes, all of which have to have a right relationship to all the others, just logically, right? That all, that, that the most chromatic one would have to be the most chromatic in relation to all the other, that's the intensity of all, to the, all the other uh, intensities. The dark is dark and the light is light. Everybody knows about that. That's a relationship, right? So if you know your light is light and dark is dark in a painting, then from that point forward, you're comparing notes to see how they compare. At least when you're putting a new note down, it's not one of those two. Yet you'd be saying, how does it compare to those two? So how you do it, it's an interesting question though. Um, and it has everything to do with the use of your eyes. So one of the things I found uh, as time goes by is that, is that most people do try to do just looking at something, look right at it to see what it is, right? And if you look right at it, you'll get a certain amount of data. I want to make this analogy because you're trying to get a truthful note, right? So I'm going to make this analogy to, 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 to uh, verifying that anything is true, right? If you say you're trying to hit a truthful note, what would you do if you're trying to in a courtroom trying to figure out if something's true? Well, you'd bring witnesses into the room. And so when you're trying to hit a truthful note, you want to look at the other notes and get them to attest that, in fact, in these sets of, in this set of three notes, that one is the green one. And in relation to their chromas, that's the most chromatic one and so on, right? And so when you get two or three other people, uh, and I say do people, I mean color notes, shall we say, when you get them into a, into a look, to, into a comparison, then you can begin to see what's true about that note. But so how do you look? Well, do you look at both of them at once? Yeah, that's helpful. You can look at one hard. Well, there's an expression we have of look hard at the one you're not painting. That's another way of doing it, but it gets, gets two of them into the room. Of course, the Velasquez model is make sure, no matter what else happens, that when you're hitting this note, you're seeing it in relation to the whole, which is the grand ensemble of the entire thing in front of you, which is something very difficult to grasp. But you can certainly, if you put down that whole set of notes and you think you're, you sort of, you've covered your canvas a bit, you can actually begin to see which of your notes is the least like, and that, that note uh, will need some, some adjustment. And then you can go back to looking at it in relation to all the other notes. I suggest that when you compare things, uh, do it in different categories. For example, if you're just trying to hit notes, and that was the word she used, hitting notes usually means just, it means the color note. Well, color has values as a factor. It has intensity or chroma or saturation. Uh, and then it has the, the, the color itself, which is red, yellow, or blue, the hue. And okay, so if you know there's only these three parts, then you can say, oh, let's look at the reds. And what that does is it eliminates, it eliminates a whole class. You're not comparing reds to blues anymore. Now you're just comparing reds to reds, which means you can reduce the number of comparisons you have to do. You can actually look at the reds and say, which of these reds is the most chromatic? Oh, which of these reds is the most purple? Which is the most yellow? You know, given the range that you have to work through, you work, when you have a red, you're only working all the way back from one side to the other of the yellow on one side, blue on the other, red being the triad, you know. So, if you can see what I'm saying when I say that, you'd do the same thing with the values. You could say, all right, of my dark notes, which one is the red, yellow, or blue? Because you've resolved the fact that we're gonna just talk about the darks. So you take that away from the picture. There's no more discussion about the values. You say, these are my dark notes. And then you can easily see when you see three dark notes sort of at once or comparison back and forth. Now it's very hard to see. If, if, if you wanna really have some fun, you might explore the idea of, of color comparisons. Uh, I mean, on color memory work outdoors, where your job is to go out there and look at, say, a sky. And I do this when driving in a car, so you can't look for more than a few seconds. But you got to register the red, yellow, blue note, so to speak, the three different notes and three different values out there in the sky and try to reproduce them when you get home. What you have to do to see that is you have to be able to see all of them at once, the three or four notes. Don't, do, don't get complicated. See three or four notes at once 
and then register them. Let your brain register who's what, and, you, and your brain will, provided you give it a category, which is the most chromatic of that set, which is the most red, which, is, which takes the place of being the red, yellow, or blue. Not, not that they really have to be red, yellow, or blue. They could be any other triad, but they, you, can, you, you can name them that way, just so you've separated them into three. And which is the darkest, the lightest, and the most middle tone. You can usually register that in a matter of seconds. But to, to do it, you do have to see the ensemble simultaneously while being aware of what they do in relation to each other. So maybe I'll end this by saying this. One thing I actually tell students frequently, it's not so much, uh, it's not about hard looking and things like that. It's actually using a variety of ways of looking at things. So if, you're, if the note looks right when you look at the ensemble, it's going to be right. If it looks right when you look at the other reds, it'll be right. If it looks right when you look at the other set of the values in comparison, in relation, you'll have that note. So that's, that's uh, at least a start on that discussion. I'm sure I've left something out, but, but um, it's probably, from the point of view of an impressionist, it's probably by far the most important skill you have to have. However, if you're any kind of draftsman, when you want to know if an angle is right, you have to compare it with all the other angles in the room. If you, have, you have to see it as part of a set. In other words, you have to do relational. And what's interesting about all this stuff, and that has to do with form, it has to do with um, just values themselves in isolation, uh, it has to do with light effects. You know, which light effect is actually the coming to you the most, most aggressively, which of these light effects is the most pronounced uh, comparison, in comparison with all the others, which isn't necessarily a question of what light is light and dark is dark. Usually it is, but so, um, but when you get to the question of drawing, it's exactly the same thing. I like the talk discussion about angles because Things are right because they're right to vertical. Vertical is this, I call it the god of all angles, but vertical is this angle that has to be right because when a picture is framed, the two sides of the frame are going to be vertical. Nobody hangs their pictures crooked, not happily, not willingly, <laughs> not without risk of them falling off the wall. But um, uh, so when you hang it, those verticals are actually challenging every angle you made inside the picture. So each of the angles you made when you were drawing, say, a figure standing, has to have been righted to vertical. It has to have been compared to vertical. And you have to have a concept of the thing fixed in your mind. And you have to work with it until it feels right to vertical. But then there's the relationship of angles to all the other angles. And I suggest to you that when you get to that place, when you're seeing how the angles play one to the other to the other, you'll begin to see sets. I sometimes compare it to, you know, poker or rummy or something. You begin to see, like a run, you'll see, see, you'll, but you'll begin to see some quality in this set of angles that does something special, this visual. And I suggest that that's a significant source of the beauty to the eye in a picture, much more so than the fact that it's a person. So, uh, or even the subject itself, that's actually our field right there. So it's big stuff to begin to say to yourself, am I, am I seeing, and this is where I began this, am I seeing, which is by definition, am I seeing relationally? And that is what Degas used to he describe it. As, that's the way Degas described it. It's what everybody, everybody talks about this the same way. Seeing is seeing relationally. If you don't see things in relationship, you're not seeing at all. So I'll move on uh, to another question. So um, what, what is lost and found? <laughs> now, you talk in Impressionist language when you do this, except... Maybe not so much. I mean, you could argue the discussion of lost and found begins with, uh, with uh, at least in a naming way, begins with chiaroscuro and Leonardo da Vinci, right? The idea of, of um, the idea of uh, the, their clear passages that are with crispy form and strong silhouettes, and there are other parts, typically in the shade, where the, say the left side of an object can't even be made out. It's really lost in the shadows, right? Well, that's the initial and first uh, lost and found discussion, you know, the chiaroscuro, the clear obscure. So, and it's a crucially important one. Um, I mean, among other things, it's um, important because without it, there's a whole lot of mystery that will be lost. If you articulate the outline edge of, a pic of, of objects all the time to the detriment of the atmosphere, uh, you lose something. You, you actually lose something visually, truth. I mean, you actually lose truth visually. Um, but lost and found has another dynamic when you start talking Boston School Impressionism. And, uh, and, uh, and so we just, in general discussion, if you're looking at an object, and it's, sitting, it's a light object sitting in front of a partially light background, the parts where the light object hits the light background will typically rather disappear. And those areas will be called lost. And, or the dark area 
uh, or the of, say that say that 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 light thing has a has a shadow side and it's sitting on a middle tone cloth, the, that shadow side will probably disappear into the shadow of the table and into the tablecloth itself. That's lost, right? Well, found obviously. And, and by the way, do you follow that we're talking about the edges of objects? Well, I'm just talking to talk about edges themselves because edges with contrast, when a value meets a value, and there's contrast between the two values, you have what we call an edge, right? So you, and that's where people, or you can discuss the word silhouette, um, but that's the point you can make patterns and other things. That's where all the action is in pictures is where these silhouettes happen. But in the Boston School way of working, there's an approach that says we're gonna, we're gonna blur our eyes. We call it coming out of a fog. You, you paint as if you were coming out of a fog is a Boston School expression. And painting as if you're coming out of a fog actually says, uh, uh, paint the things that are easy and strong first and figure out how to neutralize, shall we say, or not discuss the other ones. In other words, you have to cover your canvas eventually with the main players. You have to cover your canvas with a big plan, the great masses and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to the silhouetting shapes, you actually have to organize them in visual order. You actually, your strongest guys will be strongest and your weak guys won't exist. They'll be out of the picture. So your whole game plan at the beginning is actually to isolate your major effects and distribute them on the canvas in front of you. That's your setup. That's a setup of your painting, along with, of course, the mass of these big spots themselves. But those points drive that. Even the masses themselves are being organized around those effects, around the strength, the power uh, of those spots, it's particularly where you have high contrast and sharp edges. Sometimes it's just a pure highlight all by itself. And what that gives you in our little world of lost and found, uh, which is so significant at the beginning of a Boston School painting, is what the Boston School guys would call the arabesque. Now, defined, go to the Oxford English Dictionary, the arabesque is the figure created by the leading lines of a composition. Now, that's an interesting concept, but it's, the application to the Boston School is unambiguous. It means that you have these significantly reading points, the found ones, and you're setting up, setting those points up on the canvas, along with the, as I said, the major masses, you're setting up these points. And by the way, Sargent also talks about points. He talks about points and angles. He's talking about points though. He's talking about a spot that has a little something that'll hold it there and anchor it like a point. So you can actually line it up with something somewhere else across the panel. And he would say, and get that angle right between the, keep the plumb in your hand all the time so you can get that angle right between two points. Well, those are visual points to a visual painter. You're looking for strong, easy points, and the fundamental rule is if it's not, if it's easy and you can't draw it, if it's easy and you can't line it up with something else, well, you ain't gonna do better with things that are hard to see. So it's got an interesting whole series of things that sort of attach to it, which is a start on that discussion anyway. I, I, had, a, I had another question that was coming up that was, I thought, quite an uh, amusing one in one sense, uh, and I'm not, convinced that this person was meaning to be, uh, I know they weren't trying to be amusing, but I, I wonder if they were thinking about uh, how big a question it was, but the question, if I, maybe I have it written here. The question is, uh, what do you need to do to make a beautiful, accurate image of a still life or a model? <laughs> you know, well, probably I'd suggest you study painting. <laughs> it's one of the harder ones to, uh, to answer in a, in a simple way. I would argue though the Boston School approach is, is probably the most um, forgiving one, shall we say. The Boston School approach is Impressionism, which says that, um, it says basically put down the right color, the right value in the right place. Easy, and, and I forget who said it, I think it was DeCamp who said easy to, easy to understand, hard to do. And um, so, but nevertheless, what I try to reduce painting to for students, and it doesn't mean anything about bad drawing. It doesn't have anything to do with, I mean, I say this in a negative way right now, but you'll see why in a second. But what I suggest that a certain student has in front of him is a set of color and value. We could call color values, but that's what Hale called them. Hale was one of the Boston School teachers, the museum school teachers. Um, the rest of the Boston School guys, Tarbell, Benson, and DeCamp, uh, significantly when it comes to this way of working, Paxson too, but, but when it comes to this way of working, it's really mostly those three guys, uh, Dick Benson, Tarbell, and DeCamp that I'm referring to. Um, but they, they took the approach that the world is, 
is uh, in front of you is what the subject is. Gamel used to say, once you set up a still life, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not good to look at, it's not going to be a good still life when you paint it, which conversely, if you have a good thing to look at and you, and you frame it reasonably well, you place it within, you know, if you place the elements well, uh, it'll be as beautiful as it is to look at in nature. So the impression is essentially, though, is grabbing a slice of nature and, and that he believes actually uh, has, has, has visual magic, is, to put it in a simplistic term, and he's seeking to render it, and he's seeking to place it and then render it, this visual phenomena in front of him on a canvas. And he says to himself, well, what's the nature of the thing visual? And he says, well, it's spots of light, spots of dark, the color dis distribution of colors, it's just visual stuff. And they talk about the naive eye. Well, the naive eye is one who doesn't know what the visual stuff is, doesn't know it's a chair, a leg, leg of a person versus a leg of a table wouldn't know that, wouldn't care rather, and would, it takes great pains in a sense not to know. Now some people immediately assume that means you're going to do bad drawing, it's just not even slightly true. But, uh, but what it is though, and I refer to the word, as the word phonics, what it is is the reduction of the content of the visual world to what it really is. Color values distributed on a page. And if you're good at that, that's what you really have to be good at. Color values distributed on a page. Now, Yes, where they meet, where a dark meets a light, you're going to have to be good at making shape, or you're going to have to be good at, at managing the contrast of those values to they produce light effects. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on with that. But ultimately, the question is, can you get your head around the idea that the world you see, no matter what you see, even if you're drawing a bone to study anatomy, what you see that that bone is made up of is dark and light spots that are of particular shape and in particular relation to each other in color and value and many other ways. And that's what you have to be the master of. Mastering that leaves you with only one problem in life, really. I mean, that's the only problem you're ever going to have. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at the object that you've just rendered and you think you're so cool with not, and not notice that if, say, it's a woman, woman's figure that her leg is way too long. I mean, that's just bad drawing. <laughs> But, but you can see, or that, it, or that the form looks like a deformed leg. Well, of course. Um, so you have the same standards, though. There's no, le no fewer standards. Another aspect of this, though, that I think is kind of crucial, and I won't say any more about this, and, but that is this, that the very nature of our art form, if it's an art form at all, is visual. It's a visual art. It's a sight art. And sight art is funny, you know, because what people, have been done, what people have done for many, many years, certainly since the Renaissance and before, is that they took it to be an art of illustration. And yes, it's a sight art in that way, because you're going to look at it to see what the picture is about. But if it's an art, at the bottom line, what it is is like music, right? Yes, there are music with songs, with, with words, right? So you put, you put words to what? To music. What's music? That's the abstraction. That's the, that's the several notes playing off of each other, making beauty for our ears, making sounds that are actually, apparently, it, when, it's, when it's wonderful, make plants grow better, you know? And I think of us that way, uh, and why I would pursue this, and why I would suggest it's wise to pursue the uh, uh, world that we see in front of us that way, is because you, once you get into the, what colors are relationally and how, how much beauty there is in seeing the longer run of the reds, for example, you begin to get into the music of the eye. The music of the eye, which far supersedes the content of a picture. Would you believe? And I say it supersedes it only in terms of the art form. I'm not saying that human ideas aren't, aren't uh, you know, or the, or the idea of great, you know, heroic sacrifice or something like that. Those are marvelous in a whole different way, but what is that? I mean, that's like the art of, of philosophy or the art of moralizing or something like that. That's a different world, but I recommend that. Now, the second part of it is you want to become master of nature itself. Well, you, if you say that mastery of nature is mastery of anatomy, well, then there's male anatomy and female anatomy, and then there's ch children's anatomy, and then if you want to do a dog, you have to do a dog anatomy? And to do trees, you do tree. Oh yeah, there's a book on that tree anatomy, right? Do you study mountain anatomy and cloud anatomy and all those sorts of things? Is that really what this is about? Now, there's a form of realism today that does suggest that that's what they think it's about, right? Or that they think that's the way to pursue the best, the most um, 
uh, complete truth in front of you. But ultimately, the picture that's the, that's the, that defines the art form is the one that's beautiful in color, the one that's beautiful in form, not the one that's a, the, the best statement about, about some subject line, not the one that picks some mo moment in history that's significant, they, that they consider the most important, which of course changes from culture to culture and year to year. So just something for you to think about. But, the, but nature being the source, the, what we're talking about is nature the source. Nature to the eye, the source, is color values and their relationships to each other. That's, that's, the, that's the mastery that you have to get. Even in Gamel's terms, who was very much today's modern sort of outline-based realist, Gamel knew that the art form begins and ends with this whole set of relationships that we're talking about now. That's the, what's what seeing is, but it's also what the music is to the eye. So no matter what the subject is of the picture, and Gamble would say that probably the best thing about the subject is, is what it actually uh, accomplishes to keep you interested. That may be true, except the problem is if the subject's what's keeping you interested, it means you're not an eyeball person, it means you're a subject person. So there's some interesting points to be made, but that's a different discussion. We'll talk about subject when somebody else brings that question up. As I said, this is going to be uh, based on questions, could be from you. Uh, if something comes up that you're curious about, and I am talking specifically about my background, which is, which is uh, the Gamble slash Boston School background, but with heavily, much more heavily on the Boston School than Gamble was. If you have questions or anything that you want to uh, have me address, I mean, consider posting them just down below uh, where you see this. Um, uh, eventually, we'll probably be on Patreon, and, and, uh, but for the time being, you know, post it down there and, and, uh, or go to any of my websites.